Why is Israel important? Is it for spiritual reasons or political reasons or both? Why are there more international correspondents in Jerusalem than any other city? Why does the whole world seem to be focused on such a tiny nation? Stay tuned for a fascinating discussion with an expert on Israel. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My colleague Nathan Jones and I have in store for you what I know is going to be a very interesting interview and perhaps a very controversial one. Our special guest is Jim Fletcher, who is the founder and director of a ministry in Arkansas called Prophecy Matters. Jim, welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Thanks, Dave. I love the name of your ministry. Thank you. Prophecy Matters. Yes. Amen. Good to have you here, Jim. Thanks. Now, before we get into the discussion, maybe you could tell us why you are an expert at the Middle East and Israel. What are your credentials? Well, I was a book editor for many years. I have a journalism degree. And in the 90s, I took my first trip to Israel to do some book research and became hooked on it and started advocating for Israel then and have continued it to this day. Hmm. You've so interviewed you know. a lot of people in Israel, haven't you? I have. I have. Crucial uh, people. Yeah, Ariel Sharon, uh, people <laughs> really? like that. Yeah, it was a it was a fascinating conversation. Yeah. Well, I know that you write uh, even for WND, don't you? I do. I do. Jerusalem Post, Belief Net. Yeah. In fact, the other day I went to my computer, turned it on, and bang! First thing that popped up was interview with you published in uh, Israel Today. Yes. So the people in the Middle East really look to you as an expert on at least what the church in America believes about Israel. Uh, they do, and, and I look to them as well. I have a lot of friends over there who are very good sources. Right. Well, uh, Jim, let's get into some questions here about uh, uh, Israel. And uh, the one I want to start off with is why in the world is such a tiny nation, smaller than the state of New Jersey, why is this thing such a focus of the world? I mean, anything happens in Jerusalem, it's in the headlines all over the world the next day. Why is it? Well, I, I think I go back to what Dave Hunt said uh, one time I heard him 20 years ago, basically say because God said so. It's, it's important to God and He intends to reveal Himself in the last days to everyone. And uh, the story of Israel dominates Scripture. And uh, so, uh, it's, uh, it's a big subject for God and should be a big subject for us. You know, when you say it's important to God, it suddenly popped in my mind, it's very important to Satan also. He, I mean, it's, uh, he, he doesn't want certain things to happen in Israel. He does, he's not very happy about the Jews being regathered. No, he doesn't. And I think that starts in Genesis chapter 3. And you see that, uh, that drama played out all through the pages of Scripture right up to Revelation. Well, what is the spiritual significance of Israel? Why is it that so many Christians focus on it? Why is it that Bible prophecy ministries focus on it? What is the spiritual significance of Israel? Well, you know, the Lord said that He chose the Jews not because they were greater in number or any, anything like that. He said, I chose you because I loved your fathers and I intend to reveal myself through you. And so, uh, uh, that is the place that He chose uh, uh, for the establishment of His Word and uh, to go forth uh, throughout the world. And uh, so, I think that's the foundational reason. And also, many, many promises He made to them. Yes. I mean, thousands of years ago, he made promise after promise after promise, and we're seeing those things come true before our very eyes today. We, we do, and as I said, it really dominates the pages of the Old Testament. I mean, even looking at uh, the end of Deuteronomy, he tells them in, in quite astonishing detail exactly what's going to happen to them. Yes, that they would be, that if they weren't faithful, uh, that he would put certain uh, curses upon them. And, he, and, and, and it's an amazing list. I mean, it's teenage rebellion, divorce epidemic, uh, loss in wars, economic problems, loss of crops. And finally he says, and if that doesn't bring you back to me in repentance, the ultimate curse I will put upon you is that you will be distributed from your land. You will be ejected from your land and you will wander the earth uh, for a long period of time. That's exactly correct. I mean, I like to say to people, what you read in the Bible is what you see in reality. And he, in fact, said, after many days, I will bring you back. Yes, so he the, promised the, to bring them back. The, the long 
exile is is explicitly But said. many people say to me today, what is going on today? The regathering of the Jewish people from all over the world could not be a supernatural act of God because the Jews have never repented and they are still in rebellion against God. So why would He regather them? Well, they're, they're reading Scripture through the lens of an anti-Jewish bias, I think. Yeah. And I think that's really the, the foundation for that kind of talk because it's very very plain in Scripture. As you often say, the plain sense of Scripture <laughs> is very clear. Yes, and, and you know to me what God is doing today as He brings the Jewish people back in unbelief is a magnificent illustration of the grace of God. They don't deserve it. They haven't earned it. But He's doing it. But then what have you earned? And what have I earned? And what do we deserve? The only thing we deserve is death. But God in His grace and mercy gave His Son to die on the cross for us and make it possible for us to be reconciled to them. That's grace. And what He's doing among the Jewish people is a glorious illustration of the grace of God. It is. And I think one of the fascinating conversations that I have with people today, the critics of the return of the Jews, is that they say, well, you know, those people aren't even religious. <laughs> and my answer is, what would you expect them to be doing at this moment in history? Yeah. They're exactly where they're supposed to be in history. God said He would bring them back in unbelief physically to the land, and then He would restore them spiritually. Yes, and that's exactly what's going to happen. And in fact, you know, uh, one of the most remarkable scriptures in the Old Testament to me is one over in Jeremiah where he, two times in the book of Jeremiah he says the same thing. He says, when history is over and done with, and the Jews look back on their history. They will no longer swear by the God who delivered them from Egyptian captivity, but they will swear instead by the God who regathered them from the four corners of the earth. It's the same God. What's He saying? He's saying that they're going to consider what is going on right now to be a greater miracle than their deliverance from Egyptian captivity. Yes. And we're witnessing that, and the average church member has no concept of how important it is or that it's even a work of God. No, no clue. There's, uh, there's not much teaching about this in churches. The, the largest ministries by and large leave this subject alone. And yet, uh, you're right that uh, the Israel's glory is ahead of her. Uh, they have a, a wonderful, marvelous future that the Lord is going to provide for them. And we are privileged to watch it unfold. Yes. Well, tell me, let's shift gears for, from the spiritual for a moment. What about the political, the uh, why should the United States support Israel, not just from a spiritual viewpoint, but from a political viewpoint? Is there any reason why we should support Israel? There are, and I am glad you brought that up because there are multiple reasons to support Israel. Okay, let's go through them. One would be that they are the outpost in the Middle East, a bulwark against Islamic terrorism. Uh, the Israel Defense Forces uh, is extraordinary. Uh, you know, some people, the critics of Israel, complain about the aid that we give Israel. We've received much more in intelligence value, mm -hmm. uh, okay. and they are our eyes there. Uh, so, uh, those are among the, the main reasons to support them. Uh, uh, yes, they they have they are a great intelligence gathering uh, operation in the uh, Middle East, and they're the only democracy in the Middle East. Yeah. I mean, all the rest are are dictatorships. They are. I mean, for that alone, we should be interested in their survival as the only bulwark of freedom and democracy in the Middle East. And most people don't understand the degree to which they are democratic. For example, how do they treat Palestinians who live in Israel and who are citizens of Israel, of which there's over a million? Well, if you talk to an average Palestinian, as I have many times, and you ask them privately, they'll tell you that they would rather live in Israel because their standard of living is much, much higher. Uh, they're not afraid of Hamas and things like that. So. Uh, the Palestinian people themselves, by and large, prefer to live in Israel. Yes, but they don't want that known. <laughs> they they don't want it known. It's a it's a uh, a sticky situation for them to be in. Uh, you know, the, the Palestinian Authority um, still controls those territories, obviously, and uh, is a is a big problem. But the people who live in Israel itself, uh, the Palestinians who live there. Uh, who are citizens of Israel, and most people don't realize that there are Palestinians who are citizens of Israel. They have all free freedoms of the people of Israel. I mean, they have freedom of speech. They can run for the Knesset. There are members in the Knesset representing them. How many, <laughs> how many Jews are in Arab parliaments? None. And yet they have representatives. Well, that's a very good point, and it is one of the answers to the charges from the critics uh, that it's an apartheid state. You know, the, the judge that sentenced former Israeli President Katsav to prison is an Arab Palestinian. Mm -hmm. uh, people aren't aware of things like this. <laughs> no, not at all. In fact, as I understand it, uh, the Palestinians in uh, Israel today have all the rights except one. They don't have the right to serve in the military. 
They don't. Uh, now there is talk of uh, uh, the Druze in the north oh, yes. want to to serve and things like that. Uh, but well, I think they right. do. I think the Druze uh, often serve as trackers and that sort of thing for yes. the Israeli army. Yes. But they are loyal to Israel. Absolutely. <laughs> in fact, the Muslim world considers looks upon them like the Christian world looks upon Mormons as a cult that uh, is to be despised. Right. Yes. Yes. And again, when you talk to them privately. Uh, you see a much different picture than what's portrayed in the media. All right, you're just giving some reasons why the United States is, should support Israel, and uh, one that you can't emphasize enough is not only the intelligence, but the tremendous uh, 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 technical information. Yes. That we, I mean, these people are geniuses, and they're developing all kinds of technology all the time that we want. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about Christians? Why should Christians support Israel? Well, I think that uh, uh, one of the reasons is to uh, show people that God is sovereign and keeps His promises. Uh, you know, if, if one doesn't sanitize the Jewish history from the Bible, you understand that God is working through the Jews in history to bring history to culmination. And so, uh, you know, the story of the Jews bleeds through on every page of, of the Old Testament in particular. And so, it's, uh, as I said, an important subject to God and should be an important subject to Christians. It should be. And yet we find a great silence in the churches today. There is. Uh, I think, uh, and you would understand this as well, uh, rank and file Christians still have an interest, but at the leadership level there's a problem. Okay. Well, let's just take a pause for a moment. We'll come back and talk some more about the importance of Israel in this day and time. Okay. Welcome back to our interview with Jim Fletcher concerning the importance of Israel. Now Jim, you hear from Palestinians and some Christian leaders that Israel stole the land that they have now. Is there any truth to that? There really isn't. Uh, in fact, uh, Jews had been purchasing land from Arab owners uh, for decades prior to the establishment of the state. But They probably the, got gouged too, right? <laughs> 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 well, maybe so, but the, the, the UN in 1947 voted to partition Palestine. And actually, a key plot point in this is that Mandate Palestine included what is today Jordan. Yes. Uh, and so the Jews took the deal, the Arabs rejected it outright, and we have the situation that we have today. You know, uh, uh, this is really one of the biggest lies that's told about Israel stealing this land. Um, first of all, it belongs to them forever. The Bible makes that clear. God gave it to them, and He said it's an eternal covenant. No ands, ifs, or buts about it. It was not conditional, it was unconditional. It belongs to them. But uh, when they began to come back in the 1890s and the early 1900s, there were only 40,000 Jews in all of Israel in 1900. As they began to come back, they came back to a land that nobody wanted. It was a land that was malaria infested swamp lands. All the trees had been cut down. There were only 17,000 trees left in all the country. And uh, the Arabs uh, laughed all the way to the bank as they sold them this land at exorbitant prices. Uh, and the Arabs uh, uh, were not, quote, Palestinians. If you ask an Arab living in Israel in 1900 what he was, he would have said he was a Syrian. That's, that was their identity. This whole idea that there was a Palestinian state and the Jews came in and took all this land away from the Palestinian state is a myth. There was never a Palestinian state. Which would mean then there's no such thing as a Palestinian really, right? Well, well, talk about that. Yeah, the, and you're right, it is a myth. The, the Palestinians of today identify as such primarily after the Six-Day War. Yes. When the Arabs realized they couldn't defeat Israel in the battlefield, they switched to political propaganda. Yes. And so, the, the, that invention of the, quote, Palestinians has served them uh, really very well. But uh, in fact, uh, uh, the Jews in 1948 took what in essence was only half of what they have today because it's the best deal they could get. Mm -hmm. The Arabs, as I said, rejected it out of hand. Well, first of all, uh, what people need to realize is that in 1917 when the uh, Balfour Declaration was issued, uh, the British spoke of making Palestine a homeland for the Jews. Well, Palestine then, as you pointed out, was all of Jordan and Israel. Then in 1921 uh, the British saw the handwriting on the wall. Man, they were discovering oil all over the place. We need to curry the favor of the Arabs. So they suddenly gave two-thirds of what they had promised the Jews to the Arabs. There is a Palestinian state. It's called Jordan. Yes. And 75% of the people live there are Palestinians. Yes. And the, and the king who is from Saudi Arabia runs around with Bedouin guards because he's scared to death of his own people. <laughs> There's 75, there is a Palestinian state. 
And they keep saying, well, we need a Palestinian state. They have a Palestinian state. So they, uh, you know, all that was left was that little sliver of land of, what, 10,000 square miles, something like that. And then in 1947, the United Nations divides that yes. and says, well, you're going to have half of that. And the, the Jews felt double crossed twice, and they were. And, uh, but they said, okay, we'll accept it. And on that day, when they declared the existence of Israel, May 14, 1948, the Palestinians could have declared the existence of their state. They could have had a second state ever since that time, right? They, they absolutely could. They never let you know that. They don't. People also don't realize there are 22 Arab states in the right. Middle East, all created out of artificial borders by the Western powers. Uh, the, the problem in the Middle East is Arab rejectionism of the Jewish state, no. the single Jewish state that is Yasser Arafat said they want to push into the sea. Yeah, their real goal, you got it, their real goal is not the establishment of a second Palestinian state. Their real goal is the annihilation of Israel. Yes, yes. If they go back to pre-1967 borders, wouldn't that leave Israel almost totally de indefensible? I mean, there's what, nine mile stretch between Tel Aviv and what would be Palestinian territory? So they would basically be committing suicide, right? Yes, they would. In fact, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, last year I was driving uh, to the north part of the country. I passed Tulkarm a Palestinian city where a suicide bomber uh, in 2002 uh, bombed a, a place in Netanya on the coast. Yes. And Tilkarm is here. I'm looking over here at Netanya. It, it's a very narrow band. And so the borders are very ind indefensible. Uh, and, and I'm afraid that a lot of our Western diplomats are aware of that. You know, uh, it reminds me of a funny thing that happened to me one time. I was on a flight from Egypt to Israel. I got on the plane and this guy sitting next to me saw me reading. He said, what are you doing? I'm reading about Israel and all. And we got into a discussion and he said, you know, I just don't understand those Jews. He said, I don't understand why they're so implacable. He said, why don't they just give the West Bank to the Arabs and be done with it and have peace? And I said, where is the West Bank? Because I sensed he didn't know what he was talking about. He said, well, you know where the West Bank is. I said, yes, I know where the West Bank is. Where is the West Bank? Well, everybody knows where the West Bank is. I said, where is it? Well, the West Bank of the Nile. What? This guy had no idea where it was, and yet he's pontificating about, well, the Jews need to give that away. And it's the heart of their land. It is. It's the biblical heartland. And, and, but you're right. Geographically, people have no understanding of how tiny Israel is either. Well, we saw what happened when they gave up Gaza in 2005. Oh. It became a place to a launching Launch point for attacking Israel constantly to this day, almost every day, right? A missile comes flying through? Absolutely. It, it imperiled uh, Israel's southern population, and yet the illogic of what they do continues. That's a, that's a good point. And so if they make another concession, we'll have the same scenario. Well, our friend Clarence Wagner, uh, who used to be head of Bridges for Peace, he, he, one of his favorite statements was, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Well, the Israelis keep doing the same thing over and over. They've just, uh, you know, they release murderers, prisoners, thinking, well, that, that will make them okay with the Arabs. They'll understand they really want peace. They, they go in in 1967, take the old city, and immediately turn the Temple Mount over to the Arabs and think, well, that's going to make them love us. And the Arabs look at that as a symbol of, of, of weakness. Absolutely. And as you rightly point out, there have been several times since the Six Day War. Within weeks of the Six Day War, the Israelis attempted to get back the West Bank. I know. And, and the, the Arabs rejected it every time. In 2000, the year 2000, Camp David, the most liberal prime minister in the history of Israel, Ehud Barak, who I think would have given away his own shirt, said to Arafat, you're going to have it all. Everything you've ever asked for, here it is. And Arafat got up, walked out of the room, went back and started an Arab uprising because he knew that if he settled for anything less than the annihilation of Israel, it would mean his own life. And Mahmoud Abbas did the same thing in 2008. Yes. And so Abba Iban, who was one of Israel's greatest uh, diplomats, once said, the Palestinians have never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Their own leaders have been their worst enemies. Yes. And the graft and corruption that's there today. I mean, Absolutely. And he also yeah. called a, a shrunken uh, Jewish state Auschwitz borders. <laughs> well, you mentioned uh, previously something about apartheid, or maybe you did, uh, Nathan, but Israel's always accused of being an apartheid state. Let's talk a little bit more about that. What, what would be your defense of Israel on that? Well, first of all, the, it's, it's an effective political uh, cudgel to use against Israel because people want to make the comparison that they're like South Africa mm -hmm. in oppressing mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of the citizens. In fact, there's no com such comparison. Israel is the only open society in the Middle East. Uh, as we've talked about, the uh, Arabs serve in the Knesset. Uh, they serve in the Supreme Court. 
they work in Israel, uh, and, and so the standard of living for a Palestinian in Israel is dramatically higher than it is in the rest of the Middle East. Yeah. Well, uh, and certainly they're not practicing apartheid. I mean, they have Palestinians living in their own land, whereas the Jews have been evicted from all of the Arab nations. Most people don't know that. They talk about Palestinian refugees. They don't know that after the 1956 Suez War that most of the Jews were ejected from the Arab lands and given like one week to get out, and they had confiscated everything they owned before they ejected them. And Israel ended up with millions of refugees. That's exactly right. Uh, a friend of mine, Leela Gilbert, wrote a book called uh, Saturday People, Sunday People, in which she talked about that story, mm -hmm. a huge story that people are largely unaware of. Uh, Israel absorbed more refugees than the Arabs who left uh, Israel proper. Yes, and yet the Arab nations will not absorb Palestinian no. refugees because they want to use them as a political pawn on the world scene. Right. Well, another question I have is, um, what about what is your attitude about the current policy that we, the United States of America, have forced on Israel, and that's the policy of trading land for peace? That uh, that policy really goes back to the Johnson administration. All American administrations since Johnson basically have called for that land for peace scenario, it, but it depends on the friendliness of of the sitting president as to how much pressure is applied to Israel. The problem is that 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 process has gone on so long that the pressure is now intensifying on Israel. Well, the one who put the real hammer on them, though, was the first President Bush, because they had this influx of, of immigrants from Russia. And in fact, they absorbed more people in about a two-year period of time that would be equivalent to the United States absorbing the entire population of France in a year's time. It, they were just overwhelmed. And so they went to the World Bank, wanted a $10 billion loan. The World Bank said, well, the United States will have to underwrite. They came to the United States and Bush said, okay, tell you what, I'll underwrite it under one condition. You've got to go to the Madrid conference and you've got to start trading land for peace. And we forced them to do that. Jim Baker, who was the um, Secretary of State, that, that was one of the most anti-Semitic Secretaries of State we've ever had. In fact, I think it was interesting, the very first thing he did after he ceased being Secretary of State is he arranged for Arafat to come to Houston, Texas and receive an honorary degree from Rice Institute. That's, to me that's like, Hitler receiving an honorary degree. We make a mistake if we think that the American leadership has always been friendly to Israel. In fact, it's often, as you said, been very unfriendly. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, that's where we are at this very moment. But is Israel going to gain peace by trading land? No, obviously not. I mean, we were talking about uh, uh, Sharon's decision to pull out of Gaza in 2005. He felt that that would curry favor with George W. Bush. Uh, and, and the fact is that there's no amount of concessions that will satisfy Israel's enemies. The issue is Arab rejection of Israel as the Jewish state. That's right. And most, most people evidently don't remember history. I mean, history shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that appeasement does nothing but whet the appetite of the aggressor. Right. I mean, if I can get that, I'll put a little more pressure on. I'll get this, I'll put a little more. And you know what they're doing is the, is the uh, Arabs in, uh, in the Middle East are following the plan that was developed a long time ago uh, by uh, really Mahmoud Abbas and Arafat together, and that plan was we'll never defeat Israel militarily. So what we'll do is we'll do it diplomatically, and we'll we'll say okay, we want just a little piece. We want Jordan. That's all we want. And then we want this, and then we want that, and then we want this, and we'll get more and more and more until finally we'll have enough to launch the final attack. A lot of people are not aware that the Soviets schooled Arafat and Abbas on ways of, of attacking Israel diplomatically, politically. Yeah. They literally brought them in and gave them a blueprint for how to do it. Uh, they, they basically said to Arafat, look, you're blowing planes up, you're killing people, there's blood on TV, you have to change your MO and become a freedom fighter. Oh yes, and, and get exactly the Nobel Prize. Yes. Yeah. yes. Given to the greatest terrorist of the 20th century. Yes. What an, I know, I, to me it's still mind boggling that that happened. Yeah, it is, it's uh, as Isaiah said, uh, uh, good is evil and evil is good. They're called evil good and good evil, yeah. and that's where we are in the world yeah. today. Yes. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our interview of Jim Fletcher on the importance of Israel. Jim, can you tell folks how they can get in touch with you and your ministry? Sure. The address is prophecymatters.com or via email jim at prophecymatters.com. And what can they do when they get to your website? Can they, for example, subscribe to a newsletter or what? A newsletter, uh, access to... How often do you to, put it out? 
uh, once a month. Okay. Uh, and access all the articles that I write for various publications. Okay. And then uh, I understand you have a new book out. I do. It's called Truth Wins, uh, discussing a lot of the issues that we talked about here. Okay. And also about the emergent church movement, right? It is. It is. It's a, a huge underreported story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have appreciated your reporting on Israel, and I hope you'll continue to, uh, to do that, to, to write really uh, incisive uh, interviews and uh, stories about Israel because you're really a good source for that. I want to encourage you on that. Thank right. you. I appreciate okay. that. Well, folks, uh, that's our program for this week. And uh, I hope you will access his website and get on his mailing list and you will find information about Israel you won't find in the regular newspapers. That's our program for this week. I hope you'll be back with us next week. And until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Nathan Jones, my colleague, and myself saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. From the drama of military battles to the amazing fulfillment of God's promises, Israel, the tiny region along the Mediterranean Sea, and the people who call it home are central to Bible prophecy. Israel in Bible Prophecy is a video that will instruct and astound you as you watch Dr. Reagan and two young companions explore over 25 sites in the Holy Land, discovering how seven prophecies are being fulfilled in Israel today. The DVD also includes a special navigation menu that makes it easy to view segments by topic or location. You can order your copy of Israel in Bible Prophecy for a gift of $15 or more plus shipping. Just call the number you see on the screen or order online at lamblion.com. Lamb and Lion Ministries proudly presents the Introduction to the Holy Land Tour. Join host Dr. David Reagan as he spends 12 wonderful days and 10 nights leading this Holy Land pilgrimage. Dr. Reagan has led more than 40 groups to Israel since the ministry began in 1980, and he focuses upon sites that are related to the life of Jesus and His Second Coming. The tour originates in Dallas or Newark and visits such places as Tel Aviv on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee. Chorazin, where Jesus frequently ministered in the synagogue. Capernaum, the town that served as the headquarters for Jesus' ministry. The Jordan River. Nazareth, the boyhood home of Jesus. The Dead Sea. The incredible excavations at Beit Shan and it ends up in Jerusalem for several days to tour the traditional sites and mountains that will help you and your family have a better understanding of God's Holy Word. For an itinerary, registration, more details, photos, and more, please visit our website at lamblion.com or call the number you see on the screen from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time, Monday through Friday. We hope you will prayerfully consider joining us on the Introduction to the Holy Land Tour. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.